Hello, it's uh, seven o'clock on the dot, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, get started. I know people will be tuning in in just a minute. Um, so we'll kind of go over some, uh, some stuff that you can catch later on. Um, I wanna start off with, uh, it just feels good to be back online. Um, we haven't uh, done this in quite some time, our midweek Bible study. You might hear a little bit of noise in the background. We have our dogs uh, roaming around, wondering what's going on. Also, our kids are upstairs uh, playing as well. So um, I'm really excited about this. What we're going to be doing for the next five months, I know it sounds like a long, long time, is we're going to be going through a study on what every believer should know about the church. And uh, since the last time we met, uh, I was in prayer and didn't know really what direction we should go with this. But um, we started to build something with our church at Acts 4.33 where I put together a book it really answers the question uh, what every believer should know about the church. And I purposely wanted to make it where it wasn't specific to a single church. It's not about Acts 4.33 church. It's about the church in general. And my purpose for doing that was I'm hoping that this will bless a lot of believers that belong to churches all across the world. Um, I created this study. You can find it on Amazon. You won't really be able to see it too well. Church membership, God's uh, good purpose fulfilled in you. We'll be going through this. Every, the first Wednesday of every month at 7 o'clock, we'll take one chapter and we'll go through it. We'll have some Q&A and, uh, and just see where the Lord uh, leads and takes it from there. Uh, the beauty of this study is that, like I said, you don't have to belong to Acts 433 to benefit from it. You don't even need to purchase a copy of the book. Um, I know they tell you not to say that. You should say, go to Amazon right now and order it. It is helpful, and if, uh, if your church is looking for a good resource in uh, a new membership class, this, this book really is a good one. I'm a little biased because I wrote it, but uh, the point is there's only a tiny bit that talks about Acts 433 Church, and it's really just talks about our mission statement, which is helpful uh, to have one as a sample, so we used ours. But other than that, it's just what the Bible teaches about the church. So uh, without uh, uh, taking any more time, I know we've got some people who have already joined us. Uh, welcome. We'll get right into it. Uh, you'll notice right away the table of contents. There's five chapters in, in the book. You're not going to be able to see it real well. But for this session, we're just going to focus on, on the very first one. Uh, what's the purpose of the church? And I, I thought that's a great place to start. Like, why do we gather every Sunday? Why do we do this? What is this all about? What should this be all about? Uh, there's a quote that I found from Bridget Willard, and I really think it brings home what the purpose of the church is. It doesn't matter what denomination you belong to. Uh, the church has a, has a main purpose. Uh, whatever church you, you belong to, this, this is what it should be. Um, but uh, what she says is she says, the church isn't where you meet. Uh, church isn't a building. I think that's very important. Uh, church is who you are. Church is a human outworking of the person of Jesus Christ. And then she said, let's not go to church. Let's be the church. And that quote really reminded me of uh, one time when I was at a church seminar that was hosted at, I can't even remember what church it was at, but it was at a, uh, a fairly large church. I remember seeing on the door as you made your way out, it said, uh, the church has left the building. And I really love that because it really brought home the idea that the church isn't this physical place that we're at, that we come to one day a week or maybe two or three times a week. We go out as the church, and that was the point. Um, I don't know how effective that sign is. I know a lot of times you see something long enough, and uh, it starts to just, you know, blend in. But the, the point was, you know, we're, we're leaving this building as the church, and I think that's so powerful. So if you've got your uh, book, you can follow along. If not, uh, you'll get the points anyway. And if you happen to miss anything, I wanted to point out that uh, there's an answer key. Page 11 has all the answers, so if you feel like I went too fast and missed one of the fill-in-the-blanks, they're all there on page 11, so you won't miss anything that way. Uh, also, if you happen to have any questions, uh, feel free to type them at any point. Um, Diane's going to kind of record those for me and make sure I don't miss any as comments start streaming in. Uh, we'll spend some time at the end going through some questions that you may have, um, and uh, I think that does that does it for that. I don't expect there to be a ton of questions in this first week. Uh, the first week's more of an intro, kind of gets us warmed up for some of the more heavy stuff that is ahead, like next week is a big one. It talks about tithing. 
and the chapter is why tithing is not for you. So that, uh, that should get you thinking right there, uh, especially coming from a pastor. Maybe you've never heard that before, but uh, tithing is not for you, and I'll explain that in detail. But the first thing I wanted to ask is, what is the church? Did we lose the stream? Nope, sorry. Okay. Uh, what is the church? How would you define the church? And if you want to go ahead and take a, a, a stab at that, a shot at that, go ahead and type in what your response is. If somebody um, who, you know, doesn't really have much of a uh, upbringing and uh, I don't know, if you were ever asked, well, what is the church? How would you respond? What would be your answer to that? What is the church? I kind of gave us a little bit of a hint early on when I, uh, I said it's not a building. I know our speech, our vocabulary kind of, we do that all the time. I'm guilty of it myself where I'll say, oh, we're going to church. Well, <laughs> not really. Um, so what is the church? If it's not a building, uh, what is it? Well, actually the answer. Uh, one, one person that has this one. Yeah, we are. Yes, we are. That is correct. We are the church. Um, the church, it comes from the Greek word ekklesia, and you might be surprised to find this out, that that word actually didn't even, it wasn't a religious word at all. It, it was a word that simply meant um, uh, an assembling of people. Uh, actually, the word means call out, and so you're calling out a group of people to gather together for a common purpose. And so this happened all the time. A lot of it was uh, military type endeavors uh, that were taking place back in the day when this word was very popular, ecclesia. Uh, they would gather together and they'd do military strategies and things of that nature. Uh, simply put, uh, it means that everybody that is the ecclesia is, is come together for a particular reason, a purpose. There's a purpose in their gathering. Um, and then, of course, as uh, Christians came together, uh, they were gathered together for a common purpose. And so it, the word fit. So that's where we get our word church from. It's this Greek word ekklesia called out an assembly of uh, people together for a common purpose. Um, you'll find as you study scripture, uh, the word church ekklesia is used in a variety of ways. And this paints this, this really beautiful picture of the different expressions of ecclesia. Uh, in fact, in Romans 16, 15, it, it refers to a group of believers gathered in a house. Uh, so that was pretty neat. Um, the church wasn't necessarily just, they did meet and hear the apostles teaching, but they also, the church gathered together uh, and they would discuss what the apostle taught. They get into the word, they'd pray, they'd sing songs and, and, and they would actually have a, it'd be part of the ecclesia in a very small gathering um, in each other's home. So that's used in Romans 16, 15. Uh, it's also used to talk about a particular region. So that is, is, is very powerful because oftentimes we can see ourselves as the church, um, and, but we can sometimes forget about our other brothers and sisters in Christ um, just because they don't gather at, in our assembly uh, they're still the church, and so we can celebrate all that God's doing in their lives and all that God is doing in, um, in, in their gathering as well. Uh, it talks about in the church, it says a church is believers who met from a particular region. Uh, Acts 9.31 is where I get that from. Uh, and then it's even bigger than just us right now. So it's this grand picture of uh, believers. It can be the church can refer to believers all time. So there are Obviously, brothers and sisters in Christ, some that we have known that have gone to be with the Lord, uh, ones that lived be before we were even born, from generation to generation, ones that may, may even come after us, uh, depending on the time of the Lord's return and all of that. But uh, in Ephesians 5.25, it, it talks about that. It gives this picture of the church being believers everywhere, all time. And so... Uh, it's pretty cool, pretty neat thing. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about that uh, definition or the concept of it being bigger than just the gathering that you're a part of. The church is is so much bigger. If not, we'll we'll keep moving ahead. Um, so, who is the church? And we have the answer. Uh, Kim put the answer up early. She gets an A plus, gold star for that because the answer is we are, and it's uh, on page. Five. 
So I, I kind of set the built up, built built it up, but uh, we've got our Bible scholars that already knew the answer as we are. Um, in fact, uh, we're gathered together in Jesus' name right now, and so uh, it's an expression of the ecclesia, even though it is a virtual uh, one. Not to say that it replaces us doing this type of stuff face to face, but it's great that we have the uh, means to to gather together. Uh, wherever we are in our living rooms on this cold Michigan day or warm Florida day or wherever you're from, whatever you might be experiencing. So uh, moving forward from that, whenever you gather with other believers in Christ, uh, you are the church. It's not a building. It's not a specific place. It is, in fact, a gathering of Christ followers. That is what the church is. The church is also, 2 Timothy 1.9 says, it's you with a purpose. The church is you, and you have a specific purpose. Uh, it says in 2 Timothy 1.9 that he has saved us, uh, referring to Jesus, and called us uh, to a holy life, not because anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Uh, the grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. And so the purpose for our lives, and a main reason of why we gather as the ecclesia, is for our lives to be built up in Jesus, Colossians 2, 7. And uh, God, uh, in his infinite wisdom, um, saw that the best way for us to be able to be built up in Christ is to gather together, to get into the Word, to allow the Holy Spirit uh, to point us to Christ. And, uh, and so as we're built up, a purpose in our lives for believers is for us to continue to be built up in Jesus. And it says that God in Philippians 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 12 through 13, that it is God who works in us to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Um, I really do love that. It really sets me free to know that God is working in my life um, in order to fulfill the purposes that he's called me to. Um, and he's got a specific calling on your life. He has a specific calling on my life. And even when we mess up, God is still working on us and working to bring about the things that he has called forth for us in our lives. And so, um, you know, a lot of times we, as we gather as a church, we can encourage one another. Um, and we need that because, you know, it, life is difficult and uh, sometimes we don't understand what's going on and, and we can feel discouraged easily and all that stuff. So as we gather together, um, we help one another uh, in the faith and uh, as we focus on Christ and all he's done for us and made available for us. So that takes us to um, our mission because the church has a specific purpose and, and, and it was really actually quite liberating and, and easy to write this material, um, not from the Acts 433 standpoint, but from the church universal standpoint uh, for the simple fact that the church mission is a universal mission. Uh, and any church that tries to sell anything other than that is leading you down the wrong path. Uh, Jesus was very clear in what the mission of the church is. And uh, it's a shared mission. Like I said, it doesn't matter what church you belong to. This should be the church's mission that you belong to. And it comes out of Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. Uh, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them uh, to obey everything that I've commanded with to you, and surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. Um, so I've studied out uh, a lot of different church mission statements. They are the way um, Aubrey Melfors, who's really an expert on mission and vision, especially when it comes to church leadership, uh, he, he, uh, I'll get into some of what he said, but he, he gave us some sample church state mission statements that are there. And as I read these to you, you'll see how they actually are Matthew 28, what I just shared, a reworking of them. And then we'll see Acts 4.33's mission statement and how we also, um, stay true to the great commission that Jesus gave us. But here's some different ones, some different church mission statements, and I'm not, I'm not putting these out here as like a hierarchy from best to worst or anything. They're just, just a sample of how different churches have taken um, the Great Commission and they've, they've used that to 
build their mission statement off of, which is what we're called to do. So uh, kudos to all of all of these. These are all good. Uh, it says, one says, so that people far from God will be, be raised to life in Christ. Um, so that, that's one. Another one says, our mission is to help our community find life in Christ. Another great way of saying the Great Commission. Uh, another one was to know Christ and to make Christ known. So that, that really, that one kind of hit, hits at the uh, part we just shared about being built up in Christ. Um, so it kind of has the twofold, building believers up in Christ and then helping them go and take Christ into the world. So I like that one. That one's really good. Uh, and then the, uh, another one, to be people who provide living proof of a loving God to a watching world. So, I mean, all those are, are really good. Um, you know, like I said, they, they did a great job. I went ahead and put Acts 433's mission statement in here. It's, it's unique. Um, you know, I, it was created, not borrowed from anyone. It was created, I believe, well, I know I was part of it with, through the Holy Spirit's leading and prayer and, and, and just the formation of what God did as he brought certain people together at this time. And, uh, just go ahead and read it, and then I'll kind of break down what does our mission mean, because these words, when you share them, sometimes people don't quite understand, well, what exactly does that mean? So I'll try to do that very briefly. Uh, so Acts 4.33, church's mission is revealing Jesus to rest in relationship with him and realize the freedom he has given to respond in victory as we reaffirm uh, the gospel to the world. So what does our mission mean? There's a lot there. Um, it's really kind of neat. I didn't plan on it being this way, but there's actually five statements there. I don't know if you noticed that, but uh, five in Hebrew uh, is, is the word for, is the numerology for grace. And uh, we're really focused on, on grace. It's the new covenant in which we live. And uh, it really puts the focus solely on what Christ has done for us and provided for us. So uh, that is... That's what, what we all are all about at Acts 433 Church. But revealing Jesus, um, that really is goes back to when I was reading from 2 Timothy earlier about being built up in Christ. It keeps that the center point. And it's not, it's not that um, you know, Pastor Matt or Pastor Steve or whoever may be teaching at that moment that it's about us and our, our, our gifting. It's nothing to do with that. I mean, it's, it's God uses that to bring him glory and to build the kingdom, but it's the Holy Spirit working through us. The Holy Spirit is really the one that helps us to, uh, to, to see Christ in scripture and, and, and the beauty that's there. Um, and he can use, he uses us as vessels to, to do that. But um, uh, revealing Jesus, our focus as a church is helping believers to understand the righteousness that they have in Christ Jesus. It's what has been given to them that they are holy, beloved saints, children of God, uh, because the enemy, one of the things that he's done very successfully throughout the church uh, in general and throughout generation upon generation is to um, really take away this truth from believers, try to steal that truth so that people feel that they are always working to earn God's uh, um, favor that God isn't pleased with them, that they are, you know, they're, they're the scum of the earth, so to speak, that they're, they're dirty, rotten sinners and all of that stuff. So our job, big part of it is as we reveal Jesus and reveal who he is and what he has accomplished for us, um, that really brings forth uh, the next, some of the next parts of our mission statement. Uh, the next part is rest in relationship with him. Uh, the, one of the big things that we find, and this has been beautiful um, in our church setting, is that uh, they have, you can't earn your salvation. It's a free gift given to you. We are um, saved by God's grace. It's, it's through faith in Christ, and uh, it, it's nothing that we can earn. And so we become productive on the outside uh, because we have God's peace and rest on the inside. Um, and as we, we sit at the feet of Jesus, recognizing him as our source, uh, it really empowers us to be uh, the more than conquerors that scripture calls us. That's who we are. Um, we are so powerful and so enabled as we just uh, 
receive his peace and rest in knowing that uh, he has given us the victory over what, what comes against us. So we uh, reveal Jesus. We rest in relationship with him. We do that a variety of ways, uh, and churches can do that. Um, it's not just the gathering Sunday morning. It's getting into the word um, throughout the week and joining things like, like we are right now, talking about church and, and all that good stuff. Uh, the next part, realize the freedom he's given. I'm going to try to go through these a little bit quicker. Um, realizing that we've been freed from the power of sin. Now, that is huge because a lot of times people think that, man, they, they, there's this thing and they can't, you know, it's, it's too powerful, too big for them. Uh, it really speaks to um, some addictions that people battle and all of that. Uh, but to know that in, in Christ, um, he had defeated the two greatest enemies, uh, sin and death. Uh, we have victory over those in Jesus' name, and we can walk in that victory. Also, as a, uh, a community of believers, we encourage one another to take giant steps of faith, um, uh, believing God for incredible things, and knowing that the Holy Spirit is with us, helping us in our weakness. He intercedes for us uh, and brings to our minds, this is what I love, the Holy Spirit is our aid, he brings to us in our minds the promises that God has made, um, that we have union life with him and that we can trust God in all things. Uh, so that is, that is so powerful to know that. Um, responding in victory is, is the next part. Um, going out and knowing that we're more than conquerors. Um, not that we're going to become more than conquerors, but we are that in Christ Jesus. Uh, the moment that we uh, receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're born again, and there's a new person. We are a new person uh, with a new heart, um, and we are already on victory ground, and we have victory over every challenging thing that we'll face in this life. Uh, and then lastly, reaffirming the gospel to the world. Uh, what I want to say about that point is uh, gospel is simply evangelion, which means glad tidings of salvation through Jesus Christ. And that word is 100% good news. So one of the things that you can always look for is if there is ever a, a church or a preacher that uh, tries to sell, a, sell the gospel and it sounds like really bad, if there's any part of it that sounds bad, then uh, you just got sold a counterfeit gospel, something that is not the real thing. It's not genuine. Um, glad tidings of salvation through Christ. It's through Christ. It's not about us and how we came up short and all of this stuff. Um, that was before Christ. But in Christ, uh, like I said, we are holy, beloved children of God. Uh, we were saved and uh, we, we have the victory. So that is the good news that we share to the world. So with all that being said, every church's mission can be found within the Great Commission. That's the answer, found within the Great Commission. So the mission isn't very confusing. Every church should have the same mission. Uh, they can word it different as I gave those different examples. We have five statements because we really wanted to be clear and bring out who we are and what we're about. Other than that mission statement I shared, I think that's the only part of Acts 4.33 that I'm really going to be sharing within this study. I really want to keep it true to just church universal and what the Bible teaches about that, which takes us to our next uh, part. So we know the mission. Uh, what is the vision of the church? This is where it can be wildly different. Uh, that's why Acts 4.33 is way different than church XYZ down the street. Um, there's a lot of different churches. Uh, I, I'm in Ortonville, and it's a small community, and there is so many churches in Ortonville. Uh, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. But each church is unique, uh, be, as unique as the people that make it up. Each church has their own uh, DNA, is a way to kind of say it, um, because uh, they have unique unique giftings within the church. I'm not talking about that there's different spiritual giftings that one church has that it doesn't, the other one doesn't have. That's not what I'm saying. But, uh, you know, one church might be really good at doing basket weaving and they have a basket weaving ministry for Jesus. And then, you know, another church can look at that and go, oh, there's like crowds of people coming to this basket weaving ministry. Maybe we should do basket weaving, but you don't have anyone who's got that 
passion or that gifting and it just doesn't really work. So what is the vision? Well, visions are exciting, Aubrey Melfer says, and they energize people. And that should, uh, if you don't get excited about what the vision of your church is, is doing, then maybe it's time to get back to the drawing board and really um, put it together, structure it, restructure it. Because the truth is visions, unlike the mission, will change and should change every three to five years. And if they don't, uh, then something's off. So Acts 433 has been around for three years on the dot. So pretty soon we're going to be circling the wagons again and looking at uh, um, sl slightly altering our vision going forward. Um, so that's, that's a really good thing. It should be, um, Melfer says, a vision should be clear, challenging picture of the ministry as you believe that it can and must be. Now, we're almost at the tail end of our, our time together. I just wanted to give you the heads up. We've got about five more minutes, so I just we'll go through the vision real quick. Uh, the last couple fill in the blanks, and then we'll get right into our Q and A's. I remember I want to share this story about vision. Uh, maybe you can relate to it in, in some extent. But I had a, uh, a gathering of many pastors in the area, uh, not this area, so when I was a pastor several churches ago. And uh, we were going to do this youth type center together, and it was going to be um, ecumenical. All these different churches were going to work together and have like a pretty much like a youth center where we did youth ministry and we kind of alternated which weeks which church was going to go in. It was a great, great concept, a good idea. In fact, there was a local uh, business owner in town that was giving us, was going to give us a building to use. Um, pretty much for free. So it was it was an exciting opportunity. But uh, I'll never forget at that meeting, we couldn't, we couldn't come together on trying to figure out what we were going to offer, like, at the center. Now, of course, it was going uh, to be some time in the Word. We all agreed on that, which that's a good thing. You know, the mission was there, but the vision just wasn't coming together. Um, and so one, one pastor said, you know, I really truly believe that if we just filled it up with pinball machines, we, there would be so many kids we wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> and uh, so another pastor, um, it wasn't me, <laughs> he said, he said, when was the last time you were involved in youth ministry? And then we all kind of got a chuckle out of that because uh, the other pastor owned up, it was in the 70s, was the last time he was in youth ministry. And he said, I don't really know that pinballs is going to, is really going to be the, the thing that uh, is going to be effective. So I shared that story because uh, if, if pinballs worked, pinball machines worked in the 70s or whenever they were at the height of their day, um, they may not be as effective in 2018. See, that's why it's important that the vision changes. It's still the focus and the purpose is reaching youth for Christ, right? And I don't care if you use pinballs, if they're pinball machines, if they're effective and it works, then go with it. Uh, and in fact, in some niche areas, it, it may even work. But um, the point is, you, you look at how can we most effectively carry out our mission? And it does it just... I, technology changes so fast and is so rapidly changing and evolving in the world we live in. It just seems to speed up more and more. We, we do have to go back and we need to say, you know, look at ministries that you offer. Is this still as effective as it was? Do we need to tweak it? Do we need to maybe um, change it? Do we need to maybe have it? Maybe it's ran its cycle and we don't offer that anymore so that we can offer something else that is even more effective. So it's important that whatever church you belong to, you look at how can we carry out the mission Jesus gave us the most effectively that we can. Uh, and you do that by going to the drawing board every three to five years. So uh, the last blank, your vision is the vehicle. Your vision is the vehicle that carries out the mission of the church in your unique ge geographical area of ministry. So I'll say that again. The vision is the vehicle that carries out the mission in your own unique geographical area of ministry. All right. So um, one of the questions I, I kind of wanted to leave you with before we get into some Q&A is what are some of the things uh, that uh, 
let's see, what do I have in my writing? What are some things you think could be done at your church, the vision, that would help reach people with the gospel mission? Uh, maybe, maybe they're already going on and you're already excited about all that stuff. Maybe there's something that God has put on your heart and, and you've been praying about it for a while and, uh, and you didn't, just didn't realize that maybe that is part of the Holy Spirit's nudging that for you to get involved or to talk to other people in your church about, you know, possibly offering this one thing. Uh, but of course, if it's basket weaving, do it for the glory of God and, 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 and use it as a vehicle to bring forth the gospel, the glad tidings of Jesus Christ. Because if it's just about basket weaving, uh, there's a lot of great groups out there that, that do it. So um, that would be my question to you is, is um, you know, what, what, are, what are some, some things that, that you could do or maybe that your church is doing uh, that is effectively carrying out the mission of the church? And with that, uh, does anybody have any questions? If not, I, I'll go ahead and close us with the word of prayer. But uh, um, if, if you do have any questions, now is the time to ask. Also, if you're just tuning in now, because we are wrapping it up, like I said, we'd stay about half an hour. We are going to post this in its entirety in about five minutes. So you can go back and rewatch any parts that you missed. Um, I also wanted to point out that we will do this the first Wednesday of every month for the next five months uh, at seven o'clock on the dot. I'll try to send out reminders like a day or two before on Facebook because we all have busy lives. It's hard to keep keep track of what I it's almost Thanksgiving already. It's, it's crazy to me. And then also I mentioned uh, we're going through this book, Church Membership, God's Good Purpose Fulfilled in You. You can find this on Amazon. Um, I actually have, I think this is my eighth book that I've written um, so there's a lot of other good material out there for you as well. You don't need to get a copy of this to go through our study. I'm not trying to twist anyone's arm. I just want to put it out there, plant it as a seed, because I, I do think that there are some churches out there that maybe they're looking at, maybe this is part of the vision of carrying out the mission of their church. They're looking at restructuring, redrawing up their membership class and doing some new membership drives. Well, I can guarantee you that this will be a fun class to go through. Uh, there's only... It's only 80, 87 pages, five chapters. Uh, your pastor will love it because he can do it in one Saturday. Uh, it's not going to be weird. There's some uh, inventories in the back, some spiritual gifting inventories, some other things. Uh, really, everything that you need to know about, uh, about the church for new believers and even for mature believers as well because it kind of it gets rid of some of those misconceptions that we might have picked up along the way. So I don't know, it doesn't look like anyone has any questions, which means I did a fantastic job, you know, and either that or I've intimidated some people. But uh, week one was an intro, uh, so it was pretty, pretty easy stuff. Next month when we talk about tithing and why tithing is not for you, I said that right, it's not for you, um, there are going to be a lot of questions, and I, I expect there to be a lot of back and forth dialogue, and that will be good. It's going to really challenge you, it's going to stretch you, because it's going to be a lot different than what you think, uh, because you've probably, a lot of people I know that have uh, grown up in the church have been taught that you are supposed to tithe. Well, you are not supposed to tithe, and I will, I will be very clear why that is. And it's clearly, it's spelled out in the Bible. It's not Pastor Matt's thoughts on it. I will get into the Word, and we'll break it down, and I'm excited for that, because it's going to set some people free uh, from guilt and condemnation, those things that Romans 8.1 says that we don't have for those who are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So good stuff. Thank you all for joining us. I would just like to close us with the word of prayer. All right. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. It is such a special opportunity to gather together with people uh, that I, I dearly love all around, actually all around our country. Uh, Lord, I just pray that this whole series will be a blessing to many. Um, just to re-energize and refocus and and really to bring people together in Christ because there is unity uh, at the cross and so that's what I love about this uh, Lord I just I just pray that you will bring people um, that maybe they 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 have this this calling on their life uh, and they don't know how to work it out how to how to use these, these giftings for your glory, Lord, that somehow that we can be an aid through this study, 
Um, also, anybody who's struggled with erroneous teachings, uh, that they'll be set free and they'll see the beauty of your word and your son, Jesus Christ, and what he's provided for all of us. Uh, I thank you for uh, really bringing this all together at this time. I feel that this is a, a, a God-led uh, event, and I'm excited to see what you'll do with it. So we give you all the honor, all the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks again for tuning in. I'll see you first Wednesday of December, 7 p.m. Also, if you liked it and you want to share it, like I said, it'll be available in five minutes. You can just share it on Facebook uh, and you can even tag some friends that you really liked it, certain people to see it. So thanks again. I'll catch you next month at seven.